I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself because in the way that I approach research with teachers and children, I think who I am when I enter their classroom space is an important part of the research relationship that we build together. So I always like to start there. So I was an early childhood teacher for eight years. I taught in your equivalent of a kindergarten, um, so working with children between the ages of three and five. Um, I worked for about three years in a university preschool setting, um, and then I worked for the last five years um, as a primary classroom teacher um, in an urban early childhood setting in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and I really um, fell in love uh, with working in underserved communities when I was doing that work. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the landscape of the United States and early childhood in, in the United States. It's very different from New Zealand. Um, so some of what I'm gonna talk about today might, <laughs> as I was saying to Merrick, I'm like, it's the depressing news from the United States is what I bring to you today. Um, um, but as much as we are continuing to work as an early childhood community in the United States to bring to fruition the vision that we have for universal access to really wonderful early care and learning experiences, um, we're struggling in that work. So um, as an early childhood teacher in an underserved community, I really understood the limitations of opportunity for both my students and fellow teachers um, in terms of having both community level support from the city in which um, this center was located, uh, the state and the federal government. Um, and that really pushed me to think about the ways in which relationships in my teaching community and my, um, amongst my families and the children in my classroom um, informed how we engaged with policies from outside of the classroom. Um, so I pursued a course of study um, focusing on qualitative research. I use ethnographic methods, um, spending a lot of time in classrooms and with teachers and children um, to build a case study knowledge of um, what's happening in that classroom and how teachers and children are experiencing um, policy impacts on their daily work together. Um, I'm interested in how children and teachers make sense of policy in the classroom. It might seem like kind of a strange thing, the idea that a three or four year old is thinking about how a policy impacts them. Um, I was lucky enough to take a walking tour of the early childhood center here on campus and um, it was a fantastic setting. I almost decided to stay instead of coming and talking with you. Um, but we were talking, for example, about like napping rooms, right? And so in the United States, a teacher has to be present in a napping room if children are sleeping. You can't just check in. Um, and so that has an impact on how everything else works in the space, right? Um, it has an impact on a child's experience in that room if the teacher is there with them or they're not. Um, so just thinking about those impacts. Um, I'm also struggling in my own work, and I think this is something we talk about a lot in the United States. I think it's um, a big topic other places, this idea that we can define, measure, and account for one notion of quality, right? So this is a high quality early childhood center if they do X, Y, and Z, right? We'll know for sure, everything's great if they have qualified teachers, if they um, meet these policy requirements, everything will be high quality. I really struggle with that. So that really informs my work um, and the way that I think about sort of universal notions um, around policy design and its impacts on children. Um, and I also really um, want to support the needs of the early childhood community in which I do my research work. So I think this is really important. Um, I've been working with the same early childhood community um, in Toledo, Ohio for almost five years now, and I spend a lot of time in teachers' classrooms, and they're always kind and welcoming to me. And so I think my work should help them develop what they feel is a priority or what they feel is important, which means that sometimes the research that I end up doing is not exactly aligned with what I might be interested in, but is sometimes driven more by the needs of a group of classroom teachers. Um, or the needs of a group of administrators who want to explore something further or um, spend a little more time or get a little more support, um, which always leads to really interesting research, which is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. So I do a lot of work at these intersections of policy and practice. Um, and I sort of start by thinking about some big questions 
um, when I do my work. So what is the theory of action in early childhood policy design? What is the intention of the designer? What is the goal setting that they um, do in terms of that policy design? And then this sort of likens back to Bourdieu and this idea of social agents, right? That policymakers are people in a community. They have visions of the world that are informed by the communities that they live in. And those communities might not line up with the early childhood centers or places of teachers and children where they are being impactful, right? So there's this uh, tension there that's really important to think about. Um, so we talk a lot about how um, oftentimes this is sort of an unconscious uh, part of policymakers, right? That they might not recognize these things in themselves. Um, so I like to sort of shine a little light on what the, what the impetus might be that doesn't align well with um, teacher and child experiences and communities. Um, so again, thinking about who are the decision makers and how does this relate to classroom practice. So right now in the United States, early childhood policy is mostly informed by um, economic policy. So there's a really big focus on, um, there's a famous economist, um, James Heckman, um, and this idea that we can, uh, through early childhood, give every human all of the skills that they would ever need to be a successful member of the workforce, right, and be a productive member of society, which is kind of a, a lot to put <laughs> at the feet of, of two years of, of an educational experience. Um, so a lot of the policies that we're seeing in the U.S. right now are really informed by this idea of early childhood as an investment. Right? We're investing in children, and that investment should have a payout, and we have to account for what that payout might be. And that's impactful on the way that then teachers experience that policy. Um, you wonder what drives the decision making behind policy? So I'm sure many of you have had, either as practitioners or maybe program administrators, policies come into your program and you sort of decide, well, you might adhere to that a little bit. Right? There's some parts of that policy I agree with. Maybe I'll just not think about that other part that I don't agree with so much. Certainly as a classroom teacher, I made that decision about certain policies with my own children, right? This doesn't meet the needs of my children. In fact, it contradicts the needs of my children. I'm just gonna choose to ignore this policy mandate for a little while until someone says something. Which, you know, you can always shut the door in your classroom and <laughs> um, people don't know. Um, but that might only last for so long. So again, what drives this decision making about how we take up policy or how we design policy? And then what is the role of the classroom practitioner in policy making? I think the, New Zealand is a really unique um, and amazing place for hearing the voices of practitioners in policy. Um, Merrick and I were talking about this um, over lunch that you know he'll meet with practitioners who go back to the curriculum frameworks and say that's the part that I worked on right I I I wrote this portion about you know practices with communities that does not happen for the most part with large scale state and federal policy in the United States practitioner voices are an afterthought unfortunately um, so what does that mean and how can we include them in decision making. And what happens when classroom practitioners are not included in policy design, right? What does that mean for what teachers choose to do in classrooms and how policy evaluations down the line say whether or not a policy worked? Um, kind of an important part of the equation if the people expected to implement the policy are not participants in the creation of the policy, right? If their voices are not heard. So I think about all these things and these things all come into play in the story that I'm going to present to you today. So what I'm going to talk to you today is readiness. So anyone want to share what's, what is readiness? Exactly. That's a really good question. Um, so in the United States, oh, readiness is framed within the larger, I would say, intervention research, big data research, as the preparation necessary for children to successfully transition to kindergarten or the first year of formalized schooling. So here we have like a, a linguistic difference. Kindergarten for us is the first year of formalized schooling in the US. So um, 
right? What do kids need in order to be successful? So that's kind of the traditional, oops, I left my citation off here, sorry. Um, so other researchers argue that readiness is a construct, right? That every community decides for themselves what makes a child ready for school, right? It might be that they can independently come into school and hang up their backpack, take their things out of their bag, put them where they belong, and join a group. It might be that they can be successful um, in a academic setting in early reading skills or early mathematics skills. Um, but it's this idea that there are expectations, socially constructed expectations about what kids should be able to do when they begin that first year of formalized schooling, right? And that it's sort of what I'm focused on a little bit in this, um, in this piece is that it's this relationship between external accountability driven expectations and pressures and expectations and practices within the early childhood classroom. So that there are people outside the classroom saying, these are the things that kids must do in order to be ready for the next year of school, right? Um, so this too is a construct, but it's a construct with consequences, right? For the practitioners who are expected to get the children ready for what's coming next. So this research takes place in Head Start. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the Head Start program. Okay. So I'll just go quickly through this for those of you um, who, are, who don't know as much about it. Um, so Head Start was a federal program established in the United States um, that was a, originally aimed as a um, intervention program for low income and children deemed to be at risk in the United States. They could be at risk from housing or food insecurity, um, single parenthood, um, living in a um, low income or rural community isolated from a lot of resources. There were a lot of sort of risk factors that were identified um, as children who needed a quote unquote head start in their early years. So it was originally designed as a program for three to five year olds. Um, and again, it was focused through the 60s, 70s, and 80s on more of a play-based social-emotional approach, um, some intervention around getting ready for school skills. There was a huge component of parent education around what parents should be doing to help children be successful, which is should be doing, um, and food security. So children were guaranteed a, a meal um, when they came to school and to sort of help support um, um, children's physical health through that. Um, in the 90s, um, the federal government in the United States went through a long period of conservative leadership um, where there was a lot of welfare reform in terms of monies that were given to families were really reduced to low-income families. And at the same time, Head Start was facing rising accountability. So where there were growing expectations for what should be happening in the Head Start. Um, program and at this point the program become much became much more focused on academic outcomes for young children so making sure that children who completed Head Start which was uh, usually a half-day program for children between the ages of three and five years old in a multi-age classroom um, had exposure to early literacy early mathematics in theory it was play-based and child-centered but there were these expectations that children would be meeting certain uh, outcomes when they left the Head Start classroom and transitioned into formal schooling. Um, and Sally Lubeck has some great work on this. She did um, some work with Head Start teachers during this accountability period um, and how they thought about what their role was in the early childhood classroom as expectations began to shift for what children should be doing in, in early childhood classrooms. So Head Start really was reframed into being a readiness for kindergarten program. So this sort of has continued into 2000. So now, you know, in the 90s, we talked a lot about development, right? And now suddenly I think all we talk about is quality. I don't know if anyone else. In the US, there's this intensive focus on quality, um, measuring it, accounting for it, comparing it. Um, all states now have, have these um, QRIS, which are quality rating improvement systems, where every child care center is evaluated for their program quality and assigned a rating and then parents can go in and compare ratings in different places. Which, you know, I mean, it's interesting because I, I don't think anyone would argue 
we don't we want we want poor quality early childhood. No one's saying that, right? Um, but what quality means is different for different communities, and how that looks is going to be different in different places. So, for example, um, in my community, where all of the centers community-based and otherwise are ranked by or weighted by a QRIS system. Um, there are, on a scale of five stars, there are five star centers that I would not send my children to, but they have met all the criteria to be rated a high quality center. And there are three star centers that are at three stars because of teacher qualifications that are phenomenal centers. So it's this really is, it sort of troubles this idea that we can know what quality is simply by using a single yardstick, right, um, for all early childhood. So hold that in your brain, because we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. Um, so Head Start, which is a federal program, which means it applies to all states, um, got really excited about quality. They were like, woohoo, we can measure, and we can know that our teachers are providing a high quality learning experience to all children because we're gonna use one of these validated measures of classroom quality um, and require all of our programs to use this measure. So they required all Head Start programs to start using this as a part of their uh, program evaluation. So every year, programs had to use this classroom measure, which I'm gonna tell you more about, called the Pre-K Class. I don't know if anyone's heard of this measure. It's from the University of Virginia. Um, to evaluate all of their classrooms and use those data for professional development for teachers. Okay, well that's, that's not terrible, right? It's good to talk with teachers about what you're doing in your classroom to help children be engaged. Um, but in 2013, um, they established minimum scores for program funding. So centers were required to meet minimum scores on each of the domains, which I'm gonna show you in a moment of this measure. And if they did not meet the minimum scores, then they would lose their program funding, which seems a bit high stakes to me. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a bit um, more about that. So first, the pre-K class. So it's a measure that's focused on interactions between children and teachers. So a conversation, um, level of engagement, questioning, um, that sort of thing. It's not terrible. Um, it's considered to be a reliable and valid observational measure of classroom quality, which it's mean it's gone through a great deal of psychometric testing to evaluate its applicability in all sorts of settings. Yeah. Again, I think it might be hard to say that there's one version of quality, but apparently this is it. Classrooms are evaluated across four 20-minute cycles of observation. So an observer comes into your classroom, they sit in your classroom and observe your practice for 20 minutes, then for 10 minutes, they score your practice across domains, they return for a 20-minute observation, score, observe, score, observe, score. And what you end up with is a cumulative score for your classroom of the quality of your classroom. They do this across three domains um, that I'm gonna explain a little bit more. So the first domain is emotional support, which consists of positive climate, so how well teachers engage emotionally with students, showing warmth, respect, enjoyment. Teacher sensitivity, again, a teacher's ability to sort of understand and know what's happening in a classroom around them with students and reach out to students and make connections with them, especially if a student may be struggling or having a tough day. Regard for student perspectives. So again, this idea of students' ideas are being brought into conversations um, and a level of engagement that focuses on students' interests and motivations. And none of these seem like terrible things in the least. I mean, they all are things I think that most teachers that I know in early childhood settings are doing every day. The next um, construct is classroom organization, which focuses on how a teacher is able to manage students in terms of, sort of positive behavior management, how productive a teacher is, are the materials that a teacher needs for a lesson there at hand, or do they have to take a break and walk away, right, to get those materials and return to a student. Instructional learning formats, that the ways that teachers are presenting learning opportunities for students are engaging to students. 
And the final construct is instructional support. And these are the ways that teachers are engaging students in instructional discussions and activities that promote higher level thinking, um, cognition, and understanding rather than sort of rote instruction. So things that you could get through a really rich conversation with a child, right? Quality of feedback, the ways in which teachers provide feedback and expand on the ideas of children and encourage children to continue thinking and building in their own understanding of whatever they're engaged with, with the teacher. And language modeling, that it captures a high quality, a really rich vocabulary um, being used by the teacher with children, right? So these are the domains across which teachers are being evaluated. And they're rated for each, across each of these um, domains on a scale of one to seven, one being poor use of these techniques and seven being high quality use of the techniques. So 80 minutes in a classroom for a composite score of how well you meet these criteria. So up until 2013, this was used in Head Start classrooms as an opportunity for professional development, which is kind of handy in a way. It gives you a scaffold, right, a framework for talking with teachers about ways that they could be supporting children through language, focusing on different kinds of vocabulary that they could be doing. As a professional development tool to support teacher practice, not, not too shabby. So in 2013, when um, Head Start required minimum scores for all programs, um, this is sort of what happens. So if, again, seven being the highest, this was the national average of all Head Start programs. So Head Start programs and emotional support were doing quite well, right? Just were really meeting those criteria. Classroom management, again, you know, pretty, pretty good. Instructional support, not so great, right? So a three um, is considered a low score on the scale. The federal government decided to set minimum scores for program funding. So four for emotional support, three for classroom management, and two for instructional support. So in theory, on average, most programs were meeting the minimum score. Um, and the program that I work with decided, um, because they were soon going to have an observer from the federal government coming in and observing their program to see if they met these criteria, to have someone from within their program who was trained in using the measure to evaluate all the classrooms. Because then they would know, okay, are we meeting the criteria that we need to meet? So they went ahead and they had a program, um, a person within their program who was trained in the measure evaluate their program and they did all right. You know, they met the minimum criteria so they didn't have to worry about um, recompetition, right? Applying again for their grant funding. Except that then the Federal Observer came, and these were the scores that they had from the Federal Observer. And as you can see, there's quite a big drop here in this category. And what this meant for the program was that um, they were going to lose their program funding if they couldn't remediate their scores within six months. So this is a program that serves 7,000 children in the city of Toledo. Um, the idea that a program would have to shut its doors and the monies that went for that could be applied for by another program who would then be able to establish early care and learning for children. It's pretty devastating, right? Um, and having worked in this program um, for several years, um, I found this absolutely shocking. I mean, these were wonderful classrooms with really reflective practitioners engaged with children, knowledgeable about communities, knowledgeable about families. Um, I mean, I, I was just shocked. Um, so, like I said, um, this is not the study that I had planned to do in working with teachers. I was working on a study about how kids talk about um, violence, because that's like a line of inquiry that I'm really interested in. And I got a, so I had been spending a lot of time in classrooms, um, like following children on playgrounds and you know, listening to them about how they use like weapons play, you know, pretend weapon play on playgrounds. And I get the, this phone call that's like an absolute panic, panic from um, the director of the Head Start program saying, I cannot even tell you what just happened to us. We got these scores, 
we're going to have to recompete for our grant. Called me, and I said, huh, okay. So she asked, could you figure out some kind of professional development that we could do with the teachers to help them raise their scores? Okay, I guess. Um, I had actually been um, trained in this measure in graduate school. Um, I was on a research project where we were using this measure in early childhood classrooms um, as a part of a larger study. Um, so I know the measure very well, um, but I was not really totally prepared to design a professional development project that would help teachers improve scores in a high stakes setting. Nevertheless, um, we designed a professional development study. So um, I asked the Head Start director to ask teachers to volunteer to participate in the study. Um, the teachers um, obviously were very upset um, with what had happened um, and the possibility of having to reapply for their funds and losing their funds um, for this program. Um, so seven classroom teachers volunteered to participate with us. Um, and in each classroom, there was one head teacher, an assistant teacher, and 14 to 15 children. Um, we met with the classroom teachers individually and said, what, what do you think would help, right? What would help you to better understand the construct, especially of instructional support, that one where they had scored so low, that you think you would do better next time? And it truly was, a feeling of let's teach to the test, right? Like what do you have to do? And that's what they said. Tell us what we have to do when the observer comes so that we will get a good score, right? And I was like, okay, that's fine with me. I can do that, right? So um, we had these initial interviews to understand like what are the concerns. Um, the big one with instructional support um, was that they were really concerned that they were talking over kids. So this was a very play-focused program, very child-centered, and the teachers were really reluctant to, when kids were having really rich play, especially with peers, to just kind of jump in and turn that into a conversation where they were developing concepts, right? Because their concern was that then they would be dominating the play. Um, they would be deciding what kids were doing rather than kids making choices and teachers participating. Um, so we talked a lot about that and ways to, to think about their role in play that would help them have rich conversations with kids in ways that the construct wanted. I have to say, I felt sort of ethically uncomfortable with the whole thing in the sense that I felt like I was telling the teachers and that they fully understood that they needed to change the way that they worked with children in order to keep the money for their program. And that's something that we talked about a lot, um, you know, that, that there was an, an inherent unfairness and sort of unethical element to that, right? That we were all complicit in this sort of deal to make sure that everybody got what they needed and the program was still there in the future. So, I told them about my own research and what I do, which is ethnographic research. And they were used to the idea of people coming in and being a part of the classroom. So one of the wonderful things about Head Start is that it can be really a site to provide extra supports to children. So if we, uh, children are identified as having special needs, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist can come into the classroom and within the classroom setting, work with the child rather than pulling them out or taking them to an extra appointment after school, those services are provided within the classroom. So the kids are somewhat accustomed to people just coming in and being in the classroom. Um, so I said, well, how I do my research, because I hadn't worked with any of these teachers before, um, is that I like to sit and observe and I just write down everything that I see. I write down everything that a child says, everything that a teacher says, and then I have 25 pages of notes that take me you know, six hours to clean up and make sense of, and it's like a rich story of what was happening in your classroom that day. So we talked about how we could use those notes um, and the constructs within the instructional support domain to explore what they were doing with kids and how to think about meeting the criteria for higher quality, giant quotation marks, instructional support. So what we did is, um, 
what we called from then on joint rewriting, where I would sit in the classroom and I worked with a graduate student on this project, and we would sit for several hours in a classroom and observe the classroom teacher and everything that was happening with the kids, and we would take detailed field notes. And then we would choose chunks of that text and we would bring it back for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the teacher and talk about what we had seen. And it was actually really wonderful. We would give the teachers all the notes from um, the session that we had been in their classroom. And they would say things like, wow, I had no idea that that was happening in the block area because I was so focused on what was happening over here at the sensory table. Right? So in some ways it was just, it was really gratifying because the teachers got this sort of look at their own classroom. right? Um, and then what we would do is we would take those, we would take excerpts from those notes and we would work on rewriting them within the construct of instructional support. So you think about, okay, what does high quality, quotation marks for the audio recording, <laughs> um, concept development look like, right? How could we ask more questions of kids? How could we get them more um, engaged? And we would rewrite what we had seen in the classroom into the construct of instructional support. Um, and we did this six or seven times over three months um, with the teachers, and they began to feel really confident that they understood what the observers were going to be looking for when they came back into their classrooms. So then, because, of course, when you're an academic researcher, you turn everything into a study, we did follow-up interviews. <laughs> to find out what had worked for the teachers, right? And we were curious to know, too. So these are the teachers who participated in the study. Um, these are all pseudonyms. Um, Marsha, Emily, Linnea, Bradley, Misha, Teresa, and Bethany. And today I'm going to talk about three of the teachers, um, Bradley, um, Teresa, and Emily. Um, and Bradley and Emily were relatively new to teaching in Head Start. They had actually come through the teacher education program where I teach. Um, so I knew them sort of through other faculty members um, and just by sight. Um, and then um, Teresa actually um, had been teaching um, for a long time in the Head Start program um, and really um, had seen so many of the changes over time in terms of accountability. Um, so she had a really interesting perspective about how accountability influenced her practice over time. And this is just an example of the, um, the writing and rewriting. So this is from another teacher from Marsha's classroom. Um, and we would call it take one. Like this was our observed, um, our observation. And this was what we worked with the um, teacher to rewrite, how they could sort of like, quote unquote, pump up the language. Um, because that was really the, the focus of the measure. Um, what's interesting about the pre-K class, which is now used throughout the United States for quality rating. There's another measure that you might be more familiar with from the US, which is called the Eckers, which has been around for a very long time. It's a quality um, measurement tool. Um, and the pre-K class really focuses on interactions between teachers and kids. Um, what's interesting is that it doesn't really spend a lot of time thinking about interactions between kids. So it's sort of from an early childhood perspective, that to me is a huge part of, of what's not being captured. Um, and I have another um, paper that recently came out that kind of looked at that. Like, if we're only looking at interactions between kids and teachers, we're missing so much of the fantastic learning that's happening in early childhood classrooms, right, between peers of different ages um, and peers of the same age. Um, so this is sort of what we did. What's really interesting about this is that um, there's been a huge emphasis in the US on literacy um, in Head Start classrooms. And what the teacher is doing here is an intervention, um, a curriculum component that was required of Head Start teachers about 10 years ago. So she's like following an old accountability script here. Like someone told her you have to do this when you read a book with kids because this is the way to help kids understand books and early literacy. And she's doing what the you know, what the requirement was because people were holding her accountable to it. They would come in and check to make sure that she was doing a, a book walk, right? So that's what she called it. Um, so just really interesting how these layers of requirements are sort of piled on teachers and they, they accommodate them, right? Because sometimes that's what you have to do. So 
We collected all these ethnographic field notes from the classroom observations. We did a pre and post interview with the teachers. The pre interview was again, how can we help you feel better about this process and feel like you are going to be successful, right? And that the program will um, continue to be successful. And then the post interview was focused on how did it feel? What did it feel like to go through this process? Um, we spent a lot of time also in the post interviews because this happened after their, observa their second observation by a federal observer, so they're really like the clinching observation. We spent time in each of those interviews talking about what that felt like to be observed again um, by the federal observers um, and rated again on classroom quality. And then we had transcriptions of these joint rewriting sessions um, and the materials from the joint rewriting those take one and take two. And then after every observation and joint rewriting session, we wrote uh, reflections on sort of what we felt like was going on outside of the research dynamic. Um, so like stressors within the classroom or other things that were happening that might be influencing what was going on just to have a capture of everything that was as much as we could, everything that was happening. So like I said, I use ethnographic case study methods. Um, so my goal in spending time in any classroom is to collect enough data and spend enough time that I feel like I can write an accurate portrayal of what's happening in that classroom as a case. Um, so that means like a, a bounded document of life inside that classroom. Um, and one technique that I use in doing this is that I always refer the case study back to the participating teacher. So I ask them after I've written my case, is this, do you think that this is an accurate reflection of life in your classroom, right? Of practice in your classroom. Um, and then the case sometimes gets revised um, to reflect that. Um, I use a data analysis software called Invivo to, to code all of the data that I collect. Um, and the way that I do this is um, I have fixed codes that I take from a theoretical framework that I use um, when looking at my data. And then as I'm reading through the data that I've collected, emergent things come up. So teachers talking about, in this case, readiness, right? Like what does readiness mean um, was an emergent code. Um, and I use my fixed codes from a theoretical framework that I've been using for a while now, um, which is called comic subjectivity theory, which is like kind of a crazy name. Um, it was actually developed by a psychologist who um, does work around understanding what people find funny. So why something is funny, and her focus is on like the absurd, right? Which to me is such a great way of thinking about policy. Um, so Merrick and I were talking at lunch about um, like policy design, you know, and how New Zealand has this phenomenal early childhood framework, which I'm going to say incorrectly, Te Wariki. Bariki. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and, you know, it like has all the voices of teachers and communities in it. Um, and I like to say that the U.S. is awful at policy design, but we're fantastic at implementing awful policies. So, like, you want a policy implemented, come to the U.S., right? It can be, like, the worst policy. We'll do it. We'll do it by the book. We'll evaluate it. We'll tell you statistically whether or not it had a significant impact on the target population. Um, so this is why I use this theory, because I feel like there is this absurdity in the way that we design policy in the United States, where the lived experiences of teachers and children and families are under, on, on the underneath, right? And there's like this ever-continuous Mobius path, and always the voices of children and teachers are underneath, and the policy is pressing on the top. And so how do we understand the voices of children and teachers unless we look at the intersection of those points? Um, so it is the absurd, for sure. Um, so I went through all, we went through all of these data that we had um, collected with the teachers. And we had this emerging theme come out of the data that I just did not expect. And it was a theme around readiness. So in the beginning of this talk, um, we talked about how readiness is usually framed around this transition to kindergarten, right? Like what skills do kids need when they enter formalized schooling to be successful? And what we found is with this high stakes measure, the teachers were using the language of readiness in a really different way. They were saying there were some kids in their classroom who were ready 
to successfully participate in this measure and help them get a good score, and there were some kids who were not. So suddenly, within a classroom of three to five-year-olds, we had the youngest kids were not ready to participate in this measure, and they were sort of holding back the ability of the classroom to be successful in these scores. It was really, really hard. So um, the focus of the teachers was really on this high stakes assessment, right? Like there was a lot to lose. And this meant that they had to turn away from kids' needs in the classroom to attend to the needs of the measure, which was really a problem. Um, and this idea that there were certain kids, the second thing was that there were certain children, right, that you would want to go and sit by and have a rich conversation with when that federal observer was in the classroom, because that child was going to participate, right, and help you get a good score, which, wow, what? That's crazy. Um, and then this idea that it's better to have older children if you're being evaluated by this measure, because older children have learned the rules of school, right, that they have learned that when a teacher talks to you, you respond to a teacher. They're not going to be the three-year-old who's like, meh, whatever, right? I don't want to talk to you. I'm busy over here, and I'm not going to stop what I'm doing to have a conversation with you because you think it's important. So the three teachers that I wanted to talk about um, talked about this in reference to having the federal observers come back and do an evaluation again of their program. Oops. Um, and so this is what Emily had to say um, when the observer came back the second time. She said, the observer came in before lunch, and while we, ha we were having small groups, so I feel like we scored higher because there were lots of questions, and I can ask questions, and the older kids really get into it. They love and come to talk to me and to solve whatever we are working on together. And then it was lunchtime, and that's when it just started to fall apart. Lunch was late, a lot later than it usually is, and so you have to come up with things to keep them busy and help with that transition. I had already had the kids wash hands. I had had them sitting down at the tables, and you know, it's that time where you're like, okay, I'm getting observed and I'm stressed, so I'm trying to get them to talk to me, asking them questions at the table while we are waiting, and some of them are really little. They don't want to talk to me, and I keep trying. Where does our food come from? Who cooks it? Do they get it from the refrigerator? Is that where food grows? Of course, they're hungry, and this is their routine to eat now and then nap, and I'm trying to have this conversation for my scores, and it was like, okay, I have to push through this, but my three-year-olds were really struggling. They are tired. They are hungry. I mean, for many of them, this is their best meal of the day. They didn't want to sing songs or say nursery rhymes or solve story problems. They aren't ready for this. They're too little for me directing and questioning them when they have their needs and those aren't being met. They wanted to eat and then go to sleep. I feel like it wasn't fair that we all had to do this for my scores, but I did it because I had to. <sighs> right? So here again, what's readiness, right? There's this group of kids that are ready to participate in this measure, and she's here like pushing and pushing and pushing little kids who are not quote unquote ready. Um, so this idea that we're looking away from the needs of children and instead to the needs of an evaluation so that we can hold programs accountable. It's just, um, you know, really frustrating for the teachers, obviously, who feel like they are not meeting the needs of children when they're doing this. No, no, you can hear it right in her in her story. She's feeling at a loss, a complete loss. Yeah, she's not she's not living up to her own expectations of herself as a teacher, and, and how could she, right, in this setting? So um, Teresa, who is the one who's been in Head Start for a long time, um, also talked about um, readiness, but in a little bit of a different way. She said, um, the obs observation was a little stressful because we had one child who was overtied and, oh, well, cranky and whiny. And that was that voice that seemed to get picked up in volume and all the time, and when he does not get what he wants, the volume goes up higher. So having that, a child who is not ready for being patient during conversations or waiting while we talk, that's stressful when you are being observed. So when we went to centers and free choice during the observation, I had the classroom aides stay with the younger ones, and I made an effort to really talk with the other children as they played at the sensory table. I think I did well. I almost wish the younger children could not be observed. It isn't really fair to them. Like, if we had a classroom of all four-year-olds, I really think our scores would be higher because they are ready for this kind of interaction. But when it's mixed age, it's much harder to have the kinds of interactions that I know they want to see. 
So here's a teacher who, you know, really believes in the value and the power of a mixed stage classroom saying, you know, but if we're going to be evaluated on this measure, it would be better for us to separate these kids into groups, right, so that we can be sure we're meeting the requirements. And then, um, so again, this idea that, um, that there are certain children who can participate, right, and that we have to sort of segment off those kids who can participate when observers come to maybe protect, protect the program. Um, and the final story is um, Bradley's story. So um, I don't know how it is in New Zealand, but there are not very many male teachers in the United States in early childhood classrooms. Um, and Bradley had been teaching in early childhood for three years and had start. And prior to this, he had been in a, a primary school classroom teaching fourth and fifth graders um, and really loved being um, in Head Start. I've done some um, subsequent work with him. Um, and he is just one of those teachers that when he's in the classroom, he's like, he's like a light bulb that turns on, right, when he's talking with kids and interacting with kids. Um, so I had spent some time um, talking with him about what the observation had felt like. And he had actually done very well on the first observation. Um, but he talks about why he thinks that was. He said, I felt really good about the observation overall. I was observed in whole group and then playtime. So we could really talk during whole group. And then I had some great conversations with kiddos at the water table. I mean, it's hard to remember to always have those instructional conversations. I think as a preschool teacher, maybe you don't think of, oh, think of it so much as having conversations, you know, because the kid's language might not be developed, or maybe you don't want to override their play. I mean, especially the little ones, they're still learning to get along. But I'm lucky this year. I have a lot of four-year-olds and almost five-year-olds, a couple of five-year-olds. So a lot, at least half of them, have been with me. So this is their second year with me. So we can have these conversations that are easy because I've been teaching them how to do this for a year. And it's easy to extend and ask questions and they know how to respond and they are used to that, you know. Like they have learned how to have those conversations that they like to see on the observation. Some of the other teachers, they have really young classes, mostly threes, and it's just not that easy. I guess that will be me next year though. I will have to help the three-year-olds learn how to do it, referring to conversations evaluated by the measure. Right, so he's already thinking, in his head, okay, how do I teach the kids what they need to know for us all to be successful on the measure? Like, what, right? But you can understand the predicament that the teachers are in. They don't meet the requirements of the measure. The program doesn't have funding. So it's, it's really a difficult, um, a difficult spot. So again, there's this idea of reframing readiness around classroom constellations. You're lucky, you're a lucky teacher if you have older kids in your classroom because you'll do better, right? Um, so again, younger children are framed as not being ready to participate in these ways. So um, these teacher stories are only a small number of experiences with this policy and perception of readiness. Right now, there's like no research that features teachers' voices on their experiences in Head Start with this new accountability requirement. Um, it's kind of crazy. It's been going on now for five years. Um, in the United States, we have an office called the Inspector General's Office, which is always in the news now because of President Trump, um, investigating ethical violations and that sort of thing. Yay! Um, and the Office of the Inspector General is tasked with evaluating the efficacy and um, ethical nature of different federal policies. And so a group of Head Start leaders asked for an evaluation of this high-stakes policy. Um, and what the Office of the Inspector General does is that they have an open hearing period where um, teachers can record, or anyone, anyone in the public can record a message or submit a letter, and all of those things are collected. And there is, are something like 50,000 audio files and written messages from Head Start teachers and leaders in the United States asking for this policy to be revised because it's being so impactful on the way that they see their required practice with children. Um, and so even in the face of this review that really questions the efficacy of this policy, right? So the idea behind the policy is that we're gonna improve the quality of early childhood classrooms. And if we improve the quality, kids will have better outcomes and they'll be more ready to begin kindergarten. 
Um, there's no evidence that that's happening. So after five years, in terms of readiness, the numbers have not improved on the academic measures. Um, so it's kind of really problematic in that the voices of, um, of teachers are not being heard. Um, and yet it's really impacting the way that teachers are thinking about their work with children, right? Everything now in these contexts is framed around, is that gonna get me a good score, right? How can I meet the requirement? Um, so again, it sort of indicates that a policy aimed at improving teachers and children's interactions um, encourage children to, or teachers to frame certain children as unready to learn, right? Unready to participate in classroom interactions and to focus on scores um, rather than sort of an overall dynamic in the classroom. And then as a result, teachers' views of children and the quality of children's learning was reframed right through this measure, that the measure became the way that teachers saw whether or not kids were being successful, not the children themselves, um, when it came to these high stakes evaluations. Um, and I have to say, like, you know, I felt the, the pressure and the panic um, that these teachers were feeling, and I completely understand you know, why they would meet these, work to meet these requirements, because without it, the program loses funding, a wonderful program supporting so many children and families is disrupted, right? A lot of care is disrupted. Um, there are sort of a lot of implications to this right now. Um, we know from a lot of literature that high stakes accountability regimes, regimes are really impactful on how teachers take up and make sense of policy requirements. So when you sort of force teachers to participate in accountability, you know, in policy reform through accountability, there's no professional engagement there, right? Teachers do what has to be done, but they don't necessarily see it as a part of their professional practice. It's just a, a goal to be met. Um, and even so, teachers tend to move their practice to align with the evaluation tool because that's the expectation, right? Another thing that's sort of problematic um, is that there is now this emerging literature in um, sort of big data intervention research in the United States looking specifically at this question um, of if we segment off three-year-olds, do four-year-olds do better on these academic measures? So it's like, it's like the slow march, you know, that we're, we're moving towards this policy. You can almost see it sort of coming down the pike that a program that's used um, a mixed age model for 50 years with a lot of social, social and emotional successes amongst children um, is considering segmenting it in order to achieve higher scores um, to meet federal criteria. Um, well, on that depressing note, um, it's a it's a really hard time in the U.S. right now around accountability in early childhood. Um, I'm very jealous when we first arrived um, here. Um, there was a news story about how um, New Zealand is not participating in the baby PISA and about um, how um, outcome exams are being removed at the end of school time, I think, for many children. And the focus is really on learning rather than outcomes. I think in the U.S. we're still really stuck in this outcomes-driven model, right? Um, so thank you for <laughs> listening. I'm happy to answer any questions or take any questions. Oh, it really depends. So um, this is part of what's challenging about the U.S. context is that auspices, like the ways in which early childhood is provided really depends on local communities. So in the city of Toledo where I work, um, the kindergarten class sizes are 25 to 30 students um, with one teacher, so quite large. In other communities, it might be smaller. Um, it just, it might be larger. It just depends on sort of the resources in the community, unfortunately. Classes, yes. And 30 to one teacher. Yeah. So that's, I'm talking about formal schooling. So if it's a preschool classroom, it would be 20 
children with um, two teachers. It's a one to 18 ratio, but they usually try to keep an assistant teacher in the classroom. So, sorry, that was a, so kindergarten is formal schooling for us in the US. So that's one to 25 or higher. Yes, depending on the program. Yeah, I think the maximum ratio is one to 18, but I don't know any, pro no, one to 12, I'm sorry. So I don't know any programs that would go over 24 children with two teachers. That would be the maximum, I think. So pre-K is, um, it depends. <laughs> so usually when people say pre-K, they mean four-year-old year, the year that children are four. If they say preschool, it usually means a mixed age classroom between three and five. So the equivalent of kindergarten here. But did they also have like, like regular medium story in uh, what kind of like, you know, the thing or they follow the mainstream of the American curriculum? So Head Start programs can choose from, I think there are four or five evidence-based curricula. Um, and I think, <laughs> I think those do, it does not include a regio-inspired approach that you could, in theory, take one of those curricula and sort of layer on a regio. And there are regio-inspired classrooms and that sort of thing. And um, that teachers are meant to be using, centers have to choose a curriculum that's been evaluated as effective in improving child's, children's outcomes. Um, on academic measures predominantly. It can be, it depends. Um, the, the program that this is, um, that I've spent a lot of time in in Toledo, the classrooms are very child-centered, um, very play-based. Um, they use creative curriculum, which is more of like a framework um, rather than a directed curriculum. And the teachers have a lot of autonomy to design curricular experiences for students. Um, but it really depends on the community decision making about some of, some of the Head Start classrooms in response to the pressure on outcomes have instituted a much more sort of formalized school curriculum in the preschool classrooms. The more teacher directed. Yeah. No. <laughs> so they can't have any interaction with the, the federal observer. The other thing that's a bit crazy about the observations is that um, because there are so many Head Start classrooms, they pick a representative sample of classrooms within a, a program. So, and that's like randomly selected. Um, so let's say you have 30 classrooms, they might pick 15 classrooms at random and go and observe those classrooms and then the score is generalized to the whole program. So it's like aggregated and generalized. So it's really, it's like, you know, it's sort of, sort of the antithesis of what we work with in terms of working with practitioners for a reflective practice, that like what you do in your classroom and the decision making that you make matters. This sort of says like it doesn't really matter what you do because the score is your score regardless of whether whether you were observed or not. You talked about quality. What are the in policy? Mm -hmm. So in terms of the policy making, what are they actually trying to get out of it? Are they looking to have high quality head start programs? Or are they actually going in there with another agenda? I think their agenda is that high quality classrooms are classrooms that produce positive outcomes on measures of early academic skills. So um, most of the intervention studies in the United States around sort of readiness or impact studies on sort of the impacts of um, Head Start are really focused on whether or not when children transition to kindergarten, they are academically successful. There sort of has been a movement to like throw in measures of social emotional competency as well, but it's more of an afterthought. The real focus is on why isn't early childhood 
making up for all of these other things that might be making it hard for children to learn when they get to elementary school, like poverty or... <laughs> Yes, right. So quality is very narrowly framed from a policy perspective as a quality program is one that produces positive outcomes in kindergarten. It's crazy, it's so great. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Talking about, to yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, but also it does to practitioners' sense of who they are yeah. and their relationship with children and families. It, yeah. it dealt with just striking about their, yeah. their discourse. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, I would say that actually these teachers, they have incredibly positive views of the children and families that are in their care. Um, and so I was really struck by that as well when I brought up how did the observation go, that it turned into all the things that went wrong with the kids during the observation. Like it immediately, but I also can understand how they felt that way because so much pressure was on all of them to meet this expectation in such a, a tiny amount of time, right? So there's another story that I didn't include in here. Um, I thought about it, but some, it's, it's a little, it's a bit of a funny story. So a teacher, Linnea, um, who during her second observation by the Federal Observer had a little boy in her classroom. So the idea is that in theory, the children when they come into school should be toilet trained. But obviously like three-year-olds, eh, you know, there's a little space there. Um, I don't think any of my children were fully toilet trained by the time they were three. But um, so she's telling, this, telling me the story of when the observer came and she had been talking, they had been talking about metamorphosis and but because they had butterfly cocoons in the classroom. And so um, they'd been talking about it for weeks, you know? And finally they, the butterflies had emerged and the day before they had like released them and then they were talking about it in the morning meeting about how exciting that was. And there was this new child in the classroom, a very young one, who had a bowel movement during the conversation and she had to like pick him up and go into the bathroom while she's being observed. And she's like, and I was changing his diaper and I was shouting, remember what does metamorphosis mean like out to the children like while she's being observed you know and she's like of course like of course this would happen like in the you know 80 minutes that i'm being observed that you know this child you know you know and that was it was funny but it was also just like oh you know yeah you're in a bathroom shouting about metamorphosis because that's what the observer wants to hear, right? So is this, how do we order the needs of children over an evaluation? Um, and I, I think that the deficit perspective was aimed at the frustration with the evaluation. It wasn't that the kids themselves were not ready, it's that the me they weren't ready for the measure, right? For the, that pressure. Yes, yes, that's what I was thinking of. Maybe those transcripts of those observations yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really lovely classrooms and reflective teachers and just a lot of frustration. <laughs>